Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me on the Hope for Today broadcast. I'm your host, Doran Wengard, founder of Wengard Ministries, where we are delivering hope to every heart. Now, if you've been impacted by these messages and you'd like to partner with us, please text the word GIVE to 844-333-7227. Also, if you'd like to sow financial seed into our new organization called Flights for Hope, please go to flightsforhope.org. So here we are at the beginning of another year, and I'm reminded once again of God's faithfulness. And really, it's to each and every one of us. In my last message, I focused on the peace of Jesus and the answer that He is to every situation that we could encounter. My prayer is that you receive His invitation to trust Him completely in every area of your life. The message today comes from several blog posts that I wrote a few years ago. Things are a little different in the world now from what we knew as normal back in 2017 and 18. But isn't it amazing that the Word of God only ever becomes more applicable than ever before? Now, when I tell you the title of this message, I want you to receive it and to believe it by faith. The message is called, Good Things Are Coming. So, question is, what defines a conqueror? The word that immediately comes to my mind is winner. I've been teaching an online Bible study available to people in other parts of the world, and the people that I'm finding are more than conquerors. And really, this is described in the word as well, that we are supposed to be more than conquerors, more than winners. We're seeing healings and deliverances continually. They are taking the word and applying it in faith. One of the people that joins us consistently has has even had two people raised from the dead by simply allowing her heart to be moved with compassion and refusing to accept that anything bad can come from God. Now, I've hesitated actually to tell my stories before because people are so geared toward formulizing their situation. Now, what happened as an amazing story of faith, and either, you know, if if it's in my life or in someone else's life, can very quickly become like check boxes or maybe a recipe in other people's lives. Just put these ingredients together and and you'll have a good solution. (laughs) You'll have something good pop out. But if you miss the driving relationship with God, you won't see the same results in your own life. This is all about relationship. God has made so that nothing can be counterfeited. It has to come through relationship with Him. I've been surprised how quickly Americans are to discredit the works of Jesus, while their brothers and sisters around the world are being transformed by God's grace and mercy and healing and prosperity. I've even had well-meaning Christians quote Romans 8.18 as if to justify their own sickness or lack. But when will we finally realize that Jesus came to deliver us from all the negative effects of sin and that Satan comes to steal and kill and destroy? See, John 10.10 says, Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. But, you know, he starts out saying the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It's not a hard distinguishing point to make. (laughs) Is it stealing, killing, and destroying? It's the devil. Is it life and life abundantly? It's from God. Jesus made that a very clear distinction. The heart of Romans 8 is really a message of victory over our circumstances. It's not meant to pull people into fear and despair, but rather to offer hope and deliverance. I've seen salvations and healings and deliverances and prosperity taking root right in the heart of the poorest villages of Uganda, while Americans with just enough to get by are believing that God wants them poor and sick to somehow bring Him glory. Read Romans 8 again and see how your focus is the determining factor in what you are in what is manifesting in your life and in your body it's your focus romans 8 5 and 6 says for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit the things of the spirit for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace and i might add this now in this time see paul is saying right now As we're living, this is how you live. 
Set your mind on the things of the spirit, not on the things of the flesh. Carnally minded is not just sin, it's fleshly. Anything just physical. Romans 8.11 says, but, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Again, I'm going to say this, now in this time, through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, understand, I, I recognize the fact that I'm adding this phrase now in this time. But he says, in your mortal bodies. This is when you live in your mortal body. It's right now. After you die, you're no longer in your mortal body. So he says, your flesh should be given life by the power of the Spirit. Now, as you live in it now, today. See, I, I've experienced this supernatural life in my mortal body on multiple occasions. And I know lots of people who have. Here's just one example. I woke up uh, middle of the night and I was drenched with sweat and I, I could tell my, my stomach was bloated, uh, something was not going good <laughs> and I, the first thought that came to me was food poisoning and I was racing to the, to the bathroom just, I didn't even know if I was going to make it. I felt nauseous, ready to throw up and, and uh, the, the, I, I leaned over the commode and, and it was just this sweet and gentle voice I heard my father speak to my heart and he said you know you don't need to do this <laughs> and I looked up immediately and I, I said okay uh, what do I do and he said say this out loud food you are good for me you are good to me toxins I cancel your assignment on me now in the name of Jesus so I spoke those words out with my mouth I declared it just as he had given it to me. Instantly, as soon as I got done saying that, it felt as if someone had deflated a balloon in my stomach. It just went, went right down. I, I literally laughed out loud, stood up, and went back to bed. When I woke up in the morning, I was singing and praising the Lord because I woke up with zero negative effects of this, plus I was hungry, I went and ate a big breakfast. That's one example of how there was an assignment of toxins on my body. I heard the word of the Lord. I spoke it out. I had to act on it. I had to declare it out loud with my mouth. I had to believe it, that there was good coming from th like through this. See, God had not given me food poisoning. He gave me the answer to, to get out of food poisoning. He gave me the answer to be a conqueror. See, the devil will try to bring things against you but we have the answer. We are to be able to get out of that, be a conqueror, more than a conqueror in every situation. So in order to see God's hand in your life, the real question is not a question of is, you know, okay, is God real or is he good or even does he want good things for me? The deeper and I think far more revealing question is rather does my version of what's good for me line up with what God would say is good for me? So what does it mean to suffer for Jesus? I'm going to bring this question into it because this is where conversations have gone. And I want to answer this question. Mark 8.31 says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. See, the suffering of Jesus included sickness, pain, and death. But it included that for him so that we would not have to experience those things. That is why by his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we were healed. It was all paid for. See, Jesus paid for it so that we could be free from it. Identifying with the suffering of Jesus comes in a different form. Suffering for Jesus has nothing to do with being sick or poor or any other effects of sin and Satan in this world. Jesus said in Mark 8, 35, For whoever will save his life shall lose it, but whoever shall lose his life for my sake in the Gospels, he shall save it, or he shall find it. Suffering for Jesus is simply this. It is rejection from others for the sake of the truth. If you ever have a question from someone that says, What is suffering for Jesus? This is your answer. It is rejection from others for the sake of the truth. Identifying with Jesus is speaking the truth and being rejected. 
That's it. The truth is, we have been set free from all effects of sin. You speak that message, you will be rejected, and you will have suffered for the sake of the truth. See, my understanding of Mark 8.35 is, is something like this. Whoever will seek to preserve their own comfortable existence of acceptance from others shall lose access to the very power that Jesus died to give us. But the power of God comes to anyone willing to be rejected by others for the sake of Jesus and the good news, that he died to save us from all effects of sin. This happens as a result of the faith and love required to even walk in this reality to begin with. So the question is, what are you willing to risk? Would you step out of the boat to walk on water like Peter did? Would you sacrifice your career and reputation as Jairus did in order to save the life of his daughter? Would you take three friends and dig a hole through a two foot thick rooftop to lower your sick friend to Jesus for healing? Would you forsake what you've been taught about God from little up to preach the grace of Jesus as Paul did? See, Paul knew clearly that he would be persecuted greatly because of it. The suffering of Paul came for the sake of the truth. It came because he preached the truth. You see, it's the truth that sets us free, but only when we know it and when we believe it. So I guess I should ask you this. Do you really want to know? How much of the truth are you either unaware of or simply rejecting in order to make sense of things that you've seen or heard? I was having a conversation the other day that reminded me of the movie The Matrix, where Morpheus presents the blue and the red pills. I, I don't know if you've seen the movie The Matrix. It's been around for a while. Uh, it's not a perfect movie, but it does have some really good examples of this of do you want to know the truth? Now, Neo needs to make a choice between knowing the truth and the oblivion and slavery of the matrix. The problem is that with the knowledge of the truth comes the responsibility to act. This is also the question that we need to answer for ourselves. I have a friend who loves to ask the question. He says, if what I, were saying, if I, if what I was saying were true, would you want to know it? It's a really a good, it's a good question. Do you want to know it? Or would you like to be ignorant of it? See, ignorant is ignoring the truth. Ignorance is a choice. The oblivion of naivete and, and anonymity is kind of appealing in one sense because it requires nothing from us. But the problem with this existence is that it imprisons people into a life of mediocrity and powerlessness. This is what has characterized the church for so long. This is what the devil and, and really the, the, the people that would live in the world, what is such a hypocritical message to them is they say, well, you don't have any power. And they're saying the truth in that. Most of the people that have accepted the message of salvation have actually rejected the message of power. Many of the instructions in the Bible kind of get glossed over or neglected because we simply do not know how to apply them. And then we wonder why things are not working for us. It's much easier to blame our problems on the sovereignty of God instead of digging into the word to find the truth. James 1.22 says, but become doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. So what does it mean to be a doer so that you are not deceiving yourself? Did you notice who's deceiving you? Deceiving yourself? What does it mean to be a doer? James 2.20 says, But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? See, declaring over the toxins that were in my body was an act of faith, and it took works. I had to speak it out. Uh, James 3.17 says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So it says willing to yield. So are you willing to yield? It's a question I need to ask myself all the time. Am I willing to yield? 
Are you teachable? Are you willing to accept the truth if it's different than what you've known? I can promise you this. With a complete knowledge and understanding of the Word and the teachings of Jesus, we can and will walk in complete power over our circumstances. This is a promise. Jesus demonstrated it to us so that we would know how to do this. Quit playing it safe and risk it all on Jesus. Trust Him to faithfully do what He promised to do, and you will find a more intense power for life than anything you've ever thought possible. See Jesus Christ for who He is. Let your faith reach out and take what He paid so much to give. Remember, good things are coming when you believe in the One who is only good. You can look around you, you can look at your cir circumstances, and you can say, no good things are not coming, I, I can see them. That's only looking in the flesh, that's having a carnal mindset. Look in the Spirit and recognize that only good things come from Him who is good. When you see it that way, you can see and hear, you can hear His voice, He speaks a word to you, you speak that word out, and you will see it manifest in your life. Thank you so much for joining me again today. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you.